We have so much to cover because guess what? Worldwide Developers Conference was huge. They had so many new announcements. A lot of them were really, really good. In fact, a ton of stuff that I didn't expect Apple to do, they ended up doing. And I'm going to stop trying to summarize it because honestly, there is so much to talk about. I'm just going to jump into it. I have no idea where to begin. So I'll probably just do it in the order that they did it and try to summarize it best I possibly can. Let's begin. <laughs> Starting with tvOS, it's got a little bit of a more fresh redesign. It looks a little bit more like iOS. They updated Apple Music now so that it has lyrics that move and highlight and have dynamic backgrounds as you're listening to the song, which I think looks really cool. They, of course, showcase the new TV app that will be launching with Apple TV Plus later in the fall. tvOS got some new UI changes. It's got some undersea screensavers now, so you can see underwater with the new screensavers. But yeah, pretty basic stuff added to tvOS. Now moving to watchOS, we got lots of new watch faces alongside a decibel warning system. So now if your Apple Watch detects that you're in a noisy environment, it will warn you. You also have the option to make it a complication so that you can see how loud the room is you're particularly in, trying to preserve your hearing health. They talked a lot about health and fitness features. They're adding cycle tracking out there for you ladies who want to be able to track that stuff more natively. iOS and watchOS will work in conjunction to notify you. Of course, they launched some new watch bands as well, and they offered the streaming APK so now you can listen to to third-party music apps on the go, things like Pandora and definitely not Spotify, but they've also launched a new app store dedicated to the Apple Watch. So you can browse Apple Watch apps from the Apple Watch now and get them without having to require an iOS app alternative. So now third parties will be able to make apps directly for the Apple Watch that you can install directly to the Apple Watch, not needing to use the iPhone app store in order to get those new apps on your watch. They're also introducing activity trends so that you'll be able to see more in-depth data on your activity, giving you summaries and notifications for how you're doing today compared to last week or a few months ago. So basically giving you a lot more access to your activity trends, as they're called. And in Siri has been improved on the Apple Watch a little bit more so that you can hear a new track that may catch your ear. And using cellular connectivity, Siri will be able to determine what song you're listening to in that particular environment. And Siri will be giving you more answers to questions that are internet based than before. Now moving on to iOS 13. This one did a lot of changes that I think a ton of people were asking for the biggest one being dark mode, which in my opinion looks absolutely fantastic. They go with the true black in a lot of different apps, but they still will have tiles and different pop-ups within the app that are dark grayish. So it's kind of a mixture between true black and, and it's kind of the best of both worlds, I think, for the sake of not having too many pop-ups and layers being the same color and kind of confusing the user. They have to go forward with the gray mode, but needless to say, it will be much easier on your eyes when using iOS now. And they even redesigned the photos app, which I was not expecting. It takes up the entire display now instead of having these big white bars on the sides. And they're giving you easier ways to look through your days, your months, your years of pictures, giving you little highlights of the best moments in the past. They're even giving you more lighting options using the camera app. So you'll be able to up the lighting or instead of having a complete black background when you're taking a portrait mode picture, now you can have a completely white background for more artistic looks. And they're even adding a ton of editing options now natively to video. So if you record a video that's sideways on accident, you can easily flip it. You can change the lighting of the video. You can add filters. You can change the saturation of the video. So being able to edit videos after you've recorded them is now easier than ever, as is the photo editing effects, which they've simplified a lot more by having these little buttons on the bottom that you can just tap and adjust way easier than what they were before. And they've also introduced a new feature for privacy and security called sign in with Apple. So if you guys have noticed, there's a ton of apps out there that have you sign in with Google or sign in with Facebook. And you can do that for convenience, but usually it means those apps are able to access a lot of your data that Facebook or Google may be tracking on you. Now you'll be able to do it with Apple and give the option of whether or not you want to provide your email with them or do you want to give them like a dummy account that Apple will create like a custom email address that they can send mail to and you can unsubscribe from that email address at any time or you can never look at that email address if you don't want to. That way when signing into third party apps, it's basically just verified by Face ID and you don't have to worry about signing in with Google and Facebook, which for security reasons is a big plus for a lot of people. Plus make signing into third party apps that that require a new account much, much easier than they did in the past. They are also changing HomeKit to have a secure native built-in video support. So currently, if you have a security camera at your house, it has to be relayed to some server and then back to HomeKit. They're changing it so it can just be relayed directly to you. HomeKit will encrypt the data so that the server doesn't have any videos or encodings to access to protect your privacy. And you'll be able to easily check on your security cameras from the HomeKit app, which is a big boost and improvement for security features out there. They also redesigned the 
Apple Maps app to have a lot more data, a lot easier at planning your trip and looking for things, searching for things, having favorites is a lot easier. And my personal favorite feature they added to Apple Maps is what they called Look Around, which is essentially Google Street View, except way better because they've had their Apple cars traveling across the country for several years now. I actually did a vlog one time when I saw an Apple car and using LiDAR and 3D mapping, they were able to create basically what Google Street View is, except you're able to look around Street View and it doesn't get all blurry and distorted like you do right now with Google Street View. When you traveled through different streets, the image gets all distorted and weird. This one doesn't. If it is as good as Apple makes it out to be, maybe it won't be as accessible as Street View. I'm not sure. Once I get iOS 13 on my devices, I will let you know. But either way, the look around feature on Apple Maps looks insanely good now, miles ahead of Google Maps. And I'm very impressed what they were able to create with it. Siri has a new voice, which is better for giving long-term explanations. Like if Siri's talking for a lot longer, she'll sound more natural now. They're improving Siri shortcuts so that adding other people's shortcuts or analyzing how you do things throughout the day will automatically be suggested to Siri shortcuts. They've also updated the HomePod to recognize different voices for different people throughout the home. And they're bringing handoff to the HomePod. So if you're talking with someone or listening to music on your phone, switching it over to the HomePod is now easier than ever. And if you have AirPods, when you get a new text message, Siri will read them to you directly. And then you can respond without even calling out to Siri what you want the response to that text to be. So if you're listening to music, someone says, hey, can I join you for dinner? You can just respond with, sure, I'll be there. And then Siri will automatically send that message in return, which is really, really cool. They're also allowing you now, finally, this was a highly requested feature. With iOS 13, you'll be able to share audio with multiple people wearing AirPods. So I'm not sure if this results in you being able to share audio with multiple Bluetooth headphones of any kind. Maybe it is. The website's not telling me exactly right now, but we do know at least for sure if you have AirPods and your friend has AirPods, using one phone, you'll be able to share that music to your friend's pair of AirPods so that both of you can be watching the same movie, listening to the same music powered from one device, which has been a feature on Android, I know, for years. But now that it's coming to iOS 13, it means people are actually going to start using it. Me in particular, I have a long flight coming up in the next couple months. So having me and my wife's AirPods connect together so that we can watch stuff on our iPad on the flight is going to be super helpful. They improve the customization of Memoji, but who cares? And also the iOS keyboard by default has swipe now on it. So if you like those swipe keyboards, Apple now has it built in. They redesigned the Reminders app to be a lot more intuitive and a lot more user-friendly, a lot more options brought there. And they've even updated CarPlay to have kind of a more dashboard-like support where you can have access to when you're gonna be there, when you can play, pause music, rewind, check on your home kit devices at the time, instantly click on music or your phone or any one of those things. But they're making CarPlay better than before. It's got an Apple Music app. They've introduced the Calendar app now to support the CarPlay experience. And performance is getting even better than before. Apple's claiming you'll be able to launch apps two times faster than before. And Face ID is going to be 20% faster than devices on iOS 12. Again, I don't have iOS 13 installed on my device right now, but tomorrow I will. And I will let you know if the Face ID speed is noticeable. The volume indicator has also been moved to be more in the top left corner. A lot of people aren't sure how they feel about it, but I'm personally fine with it because it's a lot smaller than the last indicator. And this one will give you touch controls so that when you change the volume, you'll be able to use the touch screen to change the volume if you need to. And exactly as we predicted, iOS 13 basically runs on all devices back to the A9 chip. So yes, the iPhone SE and the new iPod Touch run iOS 13. And if you're asking about iOS 13 running on the iPad, let me tell you a little bit about the recently announced iPad OS. So while the iPad is still technically running iOS, you know, it's still using the App Store and it's still accessing and gaining all of the features we talked about with iOS 13, iPad OS is changing the way the iPad has been used in the past. So now you have a lot more tighter app grid, so there's less wasted space. You can swipe over and have your widgets and apps on one home screen simultaneously, getting tons of data on our iPad displays more than ever before. Slide Over and Split View have also been updated so that you can easily switch between what apps you're using during Slide Over. And also they brought multi-tab options for single apps. So you can be responding to an email while checking other emails at the same time, dragging and dropping pictures and links. You're able to press and hold on the cursor now and move it around and three fingers to copy selected text, three fingers again to cut it, and then three fingers expanded to paste it, which they made look very, very intuitive on stage. Still touch dominated. So iPad OS is still going to be a touch friendly operating system, but it's getting a ton of desktop features that I think you guys are going to like. Of course, it's still getting dark mode. They've added some new options with the Apple Pencil that allow you to swipe up from the corner of the screen with the pencil and instantly start marking up whatever display you're looking at for screenshots or even a full window. If you're looking at like a longer web page, 
you'll be able to scroll and edit different parts of it. And also, this is a new feature that's also being partnered with macOS. Sidecar is real. You'll be able to use your iPad as an external monitor from your Mac, wired or wireless. They didn't exactly say what the difference would be, but I have to imagine the wireless version of Sidecar is probably going to be a little bit more distorted and laggy than the wired version of Sidecar. But yes, you'll have full Apple Pencil support if you want to draw in desktop grade drawing programs. It'll be easy to dock your iPad with your Mac and just start drawing with that gorgeous display and stylus. You also claim the Apple Pencil latency has improved from 20 milliseconds to nine, though they didn't say if that applies to the first generation Apple Pencil or the second gen. I assume it's just going to be the second gen, but I could be wrong. And the keyboard also has more options now as well. So you're able to shrink it down into the size, into a very, very compact size of the iPhone keyboard and still use swipe on it. So if you don't want your keyboard taking up a lot of space on your iPad, the shrinked keyboard will help with that. Keyboard shortcuts are getting even better with the web. They've updated Safari significantly. So now instead of running the mobile version of every website you look up, now with iPad OS, it will load the desktop version of every website you search. Plus they added a downloads manager just like we've had on Mac for years. So if you're downloading multiple things, you'll be able to tap on it and see their progress, unlike before. You can also manage all kinds of different fonts that you wanna have on your iPad between lots of different first and third party apps, being able to download different fonts from different libraries will be easier. And the files app has finally been updated pretty significantly. We yet now have iCloud Drive folder sharing, and also you can finally connect external drives. So that means thumb drives, external hard drives will dock or SD cards will dock into the iPad Pro and let you access all of the files on the inside. Instead of plugging in an SD card and having it launch photos, it will now have a little pop-up for files so that you can decide which ones you wanna import into whatever app you happen to be using. So you now have desktop class browsing on the iPad alongside desktop hard drive and external drive support, a download manager in Safari, which is excellent. And of course, dark mode, all that new photo redesign maps and everything. All the features we talked about with iOS 13 will be here as well. Now, after iOS 13, they announced a new Mac Pro and a new Apple designed monitor. And this has to be the most controversial thing I think they did today. I think most people are excited for iOS 13 and iPad OS and watch OS and TV OS, but this new Mac is, uh, it's something else. It is quite literally a cheese grater. Like they unveiled it on stage and my God, the number of holes they have on this thing is insane, but it's kind of a good news, bad news situation with the Mac Pro. For one, the leaks we talked about of the stackable version of the Mac Pro ended up not being real. I was being played. That guy was not an official Apple employee, or maybe he was, and they ended up not going forward with his plan. Instead, they decided to go with a more PC-like workstation that very much looks like the original Cheese Grater Mac Pro, and it is incredibly modular. Upgrading RAM, storage, GPU is all an option now. Just with a simple lever, you're able to pull up and access all of the components and modules on the inside of the Mac Pro, which makes it very, very upgradable for the long-term users. And the giant amount of holes on the side of this thing are supposed to allow to keep everything inside the Mac Pro nice and cool. And the specs they talked about were legit insane. We're talking up to 28 cores on an Intel Xeon processor chip. There's five different configurations. There's a 28 core, 24 core, 16 core, 12 or eight. So you can imagine this thing is going to get absurdly expensive. The maxed out version of the Mac Pro is even faster than the top of the line iMac Pro. They gave themselves plenty of slots for upgradable PCIe based storage in the future. Lots of places for more GPUs to slide in over time. And basically what this results to in real time performance is you'll be able to essentially render three streams of 8K video at once or 12 streams of 4K video simultaneously in Final Cut Pro up to a thousand different audio tracks within Logic Pro, which no one should be doing, but they demoed it on stage. It was insane. And they said, despite all of this stuff, it'll still remain as quiet as an iMac Pro, which I can attest to is very silent. You can get up to 1.5 terabytes of RAM, which is insane. Some people are saying it could potentially handle two terabytes of RAM, but you betcha that's going to be pricey. Of course, it's rocking the T2 chip for security reasons. You can up it to four terabytes of internal storage, but honestly, knowing the beast that this machine is, I thought they were going to let you go up higher with eight terabytes down the road. But as of now, you can max it out at four terabytes of internal storage. It's a very, very interesting design. I can understand why a lot of people may not like this design. It feels like with this version of the Mac Pro, they decided to focus more on the internals and focus more on the upgradability and not so much how it looked because looks wise, you got to admit, it's not the prettiest design I've ever seen, but this isn't a machine that's made to be looked at. This is a machine that's made to get work done. And that's why I'm okay with the design. I don't think that was their priority designing it. And honestly, it shouldn't have been. This is for the professionals. This is for people who want to upgrade their GPU, their RAM, their SSDs over time. And for that purpose, I think it does a pretty good job. And on rear expansion, it actually says you can have up to 12 Thunderbolt 3 ports, which is insanity. Think about the monitors you can hook up with that thing. It just doesn't
doesn't make any sense. And of course, it still has a headphone jack. Two 10 gigabit ethernet ports, so you could hook up to two different servers or have twice the bandwidth when hooking up with ethernet. And their website right now, if you wanna to go to apple.com, even lets you look at what the new Mac Pro would look like in your workspace using augmented reality. Feel free to do that. So obviously, it's gonna take me years to read to you guys all of the different configurations and all the different tech specs, but at the end of the day, the important thing you guys need to know, this thing starts at $6,000. Now, how that compares to other PCs in the same market or with the same performance, maybe it's not too bad, maybe it's comparable, but to me, I, as someone who kind of wanted to get a Mac Pro and thought about it for a while, I'm having a hard time justifying it because originally I envisioned that the Mac Pro was gonna start at a lower price than the iMac Pro because it's not an all-in-one. It's just a computer tower. So $6,000 just for the base model and you don't even have all the accessories at that point, I'm not sure completely that I can justify that purchase for my video editing purposes, which are normally 4K at 60 maximum, maybe two streams of that occasionally, but for the most part, yeah, I'm gonna have a very hard time understanding why my iMac Pro that I bought two years ago isn't enough for what I need on the daily basis, and $6,000 is a lot, so I wouldn't be against buying it, testing it out, and maybe returning it, but in regards to whether or not this is a device a lot of you guys should consider, I think by raising the starting price and by making this thing so overkill, so over the top in regards to performance, it's gonna leave out a huge demographic of people. A lot of people who maybe wanted to buy this thing now probably feel like they can't or have no reason to, and I think basically the only people who are gonna utilize this new Mac Pro's power are the people who shoot with red cameras and are used to shooting 8K video and are used to shooting ultra high resolution stuff that they need this kind of power. But honestly, it's $6,000 and it starts at 256 gigs of storage. So as a video editor, that's insanely low. If I wanted to buy one of these things for the long term, I would have to buy one with more storage than that, at least a terabyte. My iMac Pro has two terabytes and that's gonna quickly start costing me seven, $8,000. It's gonna be powerful, but is it gonna be worth it? Is it gonna be noticeable in day-to-day -day performance? Eh. Maybe, but I have a hard time justifying it. Maybe sometime in the future when my iMac Pro isn't as fast as it used to be and it needs an upgrade. Maybe we'll talk about it. But as of right now, I don't see myself buying this thing when it comes out in the fall. It does have Bluetooth 5 though. So that's the important thing. And it's also 40 pounds if you were curious. So this thing's pretty heavy. They actually do now include a USB-C to lightning cable, which is kind of cool. Even my older Macs, like my iMac Pro came with a USB-A to lightning. This one comes with USB-C to lightning cable, which is excellent and it comes with a keyboard and mouse, which the last Mac Pro did not. So I'm glad they're including that now, but it's insanely expensive. Why shouldn't they at this point? Still though, it doesn't come with a monitor. And that brings us to the new recently designed Apple Pro Display XDR, which they're calling it. Kind of a weird name. What is Apple's fascination with the letter X and R? I don't know what it is, but this is a 6K display. So Ming-Chi Kuo, good job. You predicted it accurately. And this is the first Mac display I've ever seen that's tried to make bezels thin. There's no curved corners for those of you who are hoping for that and it has got a ton of holes on the back this is such a different approach to design that apple normally goes through so the entire back of the pro display is basically a heat sink so that they can cool down the insane amount of pixels they're running on this thing it has a million to one contrast ratio a thousand nits and 1600 nits at peak brightness p3 wide color gamut 10 bit of color depth and it's got a very very wide viewing angle so you can view this from multiple different angles and it'll still be sharp they even have a matte finish so that there's less glare. And even though this is a 32 inch display, it's still 218 pixels per inch, which by the way, that's insane. That's literally uncomprehensible amount of pixels. Probably it's going to be more pixels than anyone knows what to do with. Expertly calibrated, of course, it's got a true tone display as well. It's got four Thunderbolt 3 ports on the back, which they're claiming you'll be able to hook up a MacBook Pro to this thing with one Thunderbolt 3 cable and still get the full 6K resolution, which I'm kind of amazed by. How Thunderbolt 3 is able to handle that much is pretty amazing amazing, but you'll be able to pop it off its mount and Vesa mount it if you want to, though the Vesa mount is $200 and the stand itself is an extra $1,000. They claim it's very, very easy to detach and this is the first Apple monitor that actually swivels and rotates so you can use it in portrait mode if you want to. And just like the Mac Pro, you'll be able to see it in augmented reality if you'd like. You can check out their website and they will show you what it looks like on your desk. So insanely good specs, which is expected to be with a 6K display like this, which is just insane. Now, the crazy part about this monitor, I'm sure it looks great. You know, I'll go to an Apple store. I'll see how it looks. I love big displays. So knowing that this one is 32 inches, that's fantastic. But in the box, they do not include a stand or a vase amount, which means this monitor starts at 
$5,000. Price of an iMac Pro, still to this day, to get just this monitor, which by the way is not very thin. It was definitely more focused on the visuals and not so much about how the monitor actually looked, which is a different direction in Apple. I'm okay with that. Being more functional and not so much about the aesthetics is good, but they include a power cord and a Thunderbolt 3 cable. That's it. If you want to have a stand to mount this monitor on, that's going to cost you an extra $1,000. Now, granted, I'm sure the stand is very nice and it allows you to adjust the height and adjust the angle that the monitor sits at, but that means you're at a starting price of $6,000 just to have a baseline Mac Pro and 6K monitor that hooks up to it. That's right, to have the bare minimum, cheapest setup for the new Mac Pro and new Pro display, you're in $12,000 dollars for this setup. Now, granted, it's a very nice setup. This Mac Pro is insanely fast and really good specs. The monitor is going to look insanely good, probably better than anyone else out there has created in regards to 6K true tone, extreme dynamic range as they talked about today, but it's an expensive one. So people like MKBHD and John Morrison, YouTubers essentially, they'll be buying this thing, but I'm not in that realm yet, you know? <laughs> it took me six months of saving my income in order to be able to afford the iMac Pro. So a lot of you guys may watch me and be like, oh, Drew spent $5,000 on an iMac Pro. He could easily spend $12,000 on this setup. Sadly, I'm going to have to stop you there and say, no, our channel does not have that kind of income or that kind of growth at this point or this type of audience that I can comfortably afford something like that. Like I said, I wouldn't be against buying it to test it out and returning it, but this is a whole different demographic they're appealing to. I really think that there was a moderately obtainable audience out there that weren't filming on red cameras per se, but they could afford the new Mac Pro and the Apple standalone monitors, but last Apple monitor they sold, I believe was $1,000. Then the LG Ultrafine was, you know, $1,200, $1,500. This is such a drastic jump to $6,000 just to get the monitor working on your desk. To me, even as an Apple sheep, even as a guy who admits Apple products can be kind of expensive, this is too much. I think they went overkill. I would have preferred a 32 inch 5K display with the thin bezels and just use the same dock that an iMac Pro sits on. It makes no sense to me that an iMac Pro with the fact that it has Xeon chips, it runs silent, it has speakers, it has a camera. By the way, this standalone monitor does not have a built-in camera. It does not have built-in speakers. It doesn't have built-in face ID like we were hoping. And they don't claim it's going to help your MacBook if you dock it to anything with any kind of GPU power. So it's not like there's an extended GPU in here that's going to help your device run even better. There's just not enough here really for it to be worth the $5,000, technically $6,000 starting price. It's just not enough. Just being good enough enough with color calibration and good enough with the pixels to me does not justify that price tag in any way. If anyone was thinking about upgrading, just buy an iMac Pro. I get that it's not new, but it's literally cheaper and it'll plug in and work out of the box. You don't have to spend a thousand dollars separately on a stand. I'm sure tons of YouTubers have already said this already, but yeah, without question, this is too expensive. There's not a very large market for this at all. So that sums up the hardware they announced at the event. We'll probably talk more about it later in some more future videos, but design and specifications and the features of these new products are great. It's just the price points that I think ruin it for everyone. Now moving on to macOS Catalina. macOS Catalina is of course, as we predicted, breaking apart iTunes into separate apps. So now you'll have the music app, you'll have the Apple TV app, and you'll have the podcast app, kind of brought over from the iPad now to the Mac. And a lot of you guys were curious, what are we gonna do for iTunes syncing with our iPhones or our iPods, for those of you who still do that. Now, instead of having iTunes pop up when you plug in, Finder will pop up and that whole sync synchronization process has now been moved to the Finder app. They didn't talk about bringing these three apps to Windows, so maybe they are, but maybe they're just cutting Windows out of the equation now and saying, nope, Windows, you don't get that anymore, which kind of sucks. So I guess you'll have to keep using the old version of iTunes for you Windows users out there who still sync music to your phone and iPod. But honestly, I don't think that's a lot of you. The podcast app, the TV app, the music app all look very fresh, very modern compared to iTunes did in the past. I think it's mostly just catch up with Mac OS at this point. Plus they're working on this thing called Project Catalyst which involves letting third-party developers who have built iOS apps for the iPad easily translate them over to the Mac easier than before. So apps like Asphalt 9 or Twitter who already have versions on the iPad, it'll be very, very easy for them to translate them over to the Mac now. So maybe the YouTube app, hopefully Twitter and more iPad level games will be suddenly available on the Mac App Store. Regardless, the Mac App Store should be getting a lot more rich now thanks to that new coding changes. They've of course brought the new reminders redesigned to the Mac. And like we talked about earlier, Sidecar, which allows you to use your iPad as an external monitor with any Mac you currently have. They've brought screen time to the Mac as well.
well as we anticipated. And of course, there's a new app they're launching across all of their devices called Find My, which is kind of interesting. It makes Apple's devices kind of turn into tile security chips. I don't know if you guys have heard of those things, but they're saying now it's combining Find My Friends with Find My iPhone, first of all. We knew that. But the other thing worth mentioning is that even if your MacBook is for some reason stolen or lost and it's not connected to the internet, it will send out a ping notification that's encrypted that other people won't know about to any other devices in the area, any other Apple product that are connected to the internet, whether it be cellular or Wi-Fi. Using Find My, it will ping those other devices and let you know where your MacBook is, even if it's not connected to Wi-Fi, which I think is pretty impressive. Tile basically does that if you want to attach those little tiles to things and it's not connected to your phone. It will ping other tiles in the area to let you know. And since Apple products are incredibly common, so many people have iPhones, iPads, Apple Watches these days, it should be very, very difficult for you to find a place where your MacBook would not be able to ping another Apple product and allow you to know where your Mac was last located. There's more features that you'll be able to verify via your Apple Watch on your Mac as well. And they also introduced some new accessibility features like voice control with your Mac and your iPhone so that people who aren't able to use their hands will be able to access all of the same features we access on our iPhones, Macs, and iPads as before, which is great for accessibility. It appears that in regards to compatibility with Mac OS Catalina, you're going to need a 2015 12-inch MacBook or later, 2012 MacBook Air or later, 2012 MacBook Pro or later, which is a pretty good lifespan if you consider Mac OS Catalina is going to last us into 2020. 2012 MacBook Pro is getting eight years of support. Mac Mini 2012 or later, iMac 2012 or later, and of course the 2013 Mac Pro can still run Catalina, as can the iMac Pro and all the new versions. So pretty good compatibility list, though one thing I forgot to mention earlier, iPad OS compatibility goes a little bit further back than iOS 13. The iPad Mini 4, which has an A8 chip, is actually getting iPad OS, which I was not expecting. I thought they were cutting it off at the A9 chip. Turns out it'll work with the iPad mini fifth generation, which we just got, and the mini four, plus the iPad Air third generation, and even the iPad Air 2. The iPad 5 and iPad 6 will be getting it as well, and of course all the new iPad Pros. So to me this is pretty impressive. iPad OS goes really really far back, and iOS 13 was cut off exactly where we thought, and I think that basically wraps it up because the rest of the event was mostly talking about augmented reality and Swift and new developer coding options, which are cool, but this video is long enough as it is, and I need to wrap it up. So so overall, this event was so feature packed. I still have so many different topics I want to dive into. So if there was something that you felt like I didn't talk about enough, make sure you let me know over on Twitter or join our Discord. But my God, what a packed filled event. This was a ton of fun to watch. This was a ton of fun to see all the features we're getting. iOS 13 and iPadOS are by far my favorite new features. I love all of the changes they're bringing to this operating system. It's just making them so versatile and so fantastic. The most disappointing part of the event is probably that they didn't announce the Apple card. It's still coming later this summer. And the prices for the new display in the Mac Pro are outrageous. I was considering buying the new standalone monitor when I was reading rumors about it, but now that we know the actual price of it, it's insanely too expensive. And there's no speakers, there's no webcam, there's no things that we should expect to get with $5,000, $6,000 monitors. To me, just having good color accuracy in a 6K resolution, thin bezels, you know, it, it's cool, but it hasn't sold me that it's worth that price point. So, that was quite disappointing. I'll make more videos about it later. But anyways, thank you guys for watching. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I will see you in the next one.